excuse me. Good morning. If you guys would uh, turn to Luke chapter 15 with me, we'll be reading uh, verses 11 through 32, the parable of the lost son. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would uh, have gladly filled uh, his stomach with the pods of the swine that were eating. Uh, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he, gave to, uh, when he came to his senses, he said, how many, fathers, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am here dying with hunger? I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father sent, saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. And he was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the ser uh, servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and was lost and has been found. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for this day. I'd like to thank you for everyone who is here, regardless of numbers. I pray that uh, we all uh, use our ears to listen to the sermon today. Uh, though it may be one sermon, I pray that you allow us to hear exactly what you need us to hear, so that way we may apply it to the world as soon as we leave these uh, doors of the church. And uh, Lord, on this Father's Day, I'd like to uh, ask uh, for a blessed day to uh, be with our fathers, celebrate with them, and uh, also to recognize you as our Heavenly Father. And I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. You might have noticed last week before the service, uh, Emmett was up here talking to me. How many of you remember that? Right before the service, Mickey was standing over here waiting to start the service, and Emmett was over here holding up the service. He was excited about his friend who is sitting with him today, uh, Gideon, is how she pronounced her name, spelled uh, spell with a Y, like Miriam, but she pronounces it with the sound of a J, Gideon. So I had, it took me a while. I was practicing that today so I could get it right. He was excited about his friend. Uh, bringing her to church, and told me that he has been witnessing to her and sharing the gospel with her, and, and he was so excited. He says, I think she's ready. I think she's really ready, Pastor. I'm confident that she's ready. Would you please talk to her after the service? And so we did. All three of us went into the prayer room, and we talked for a while, and he reiterated there 
his confidence in what the Lord is doing in her life. Well, his confidence prevailed because she prayed to receive Christ as her Savior last week, and we're really excited about that. Amen? We are. We gave her some, some literature, uh, gave her a welcome packet, and she's taking that, and we're excited to be able to, to um, disciple her along the way in her newfound faith in Christ. Next step is baptism, and so I've, rem I've reminded her of that, and I'm sure she's been thinking about that. Be praying for Gideon, if you will, and her new faith in the Lord, and uh, be praying for her friend Emmett, who has become her kind of her personal discipler. Also, be praying for base camp. Johnny's going to be doing the majority of the preaching at base camp, so he's going to be kind of the highlight speaker there for base camp for, f for four nights or five nights. I think we had a kind of discussion over how many nights it's going to be. It'll be in the evenings around our fireplace, usually when we do the teaching. And so uh, Johnny's going to be doing most of that teaching. And so be praying for him. We've got a handful of kids that are hoping to go. We're always excited about that. It's always a good time. Brand new camp this year. It was moved from one side of the camp to another side, and it's all going to be completely brand new. So we're excited that we're going to be able to break in a new camp, Imperial Community Church. So we're excited about that. Well, if you'll take notice of our passage this morning... Where we are, we are in Luke chapter 15, and I wanted to start with uh, the story of the prodigal son that we have here, which I've entitled, A Father's Love, and the key to understanding what Jesus was saying is to look at the passage in context, and of course that's what we want to do. We want to look at it in context. So how do I do that? Well, as I looked at the verse, I realized that there are three key players as I looked at the passage, I mean, I, I realized that there are three key players. The dad or the father, the man who has two sons. And I can relate to him in that way because I have two sons. I never had any daughters. The Lord never privileged me with daughters. I wish I would have had daughters. Uh, it's too late to want daughters. Maybe someday, maybe if I cross my fingers, as they say, I may get granddaughters. I cannot relate in that way, but I can relate that he has two sons, and I have two sons. He has the younger son and the older son, and they are the significant players in the parable. But who are they, or who do they represent? And this was what's the big question in my mind. Who are they, and who do they represent? These are parables, remember, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And Jesus used a lot of these, and so I was wondering, who are they? Who, do they really, who are they really representing? That was the big question in my mind. Knowing who they are will give us the key. But um, how do we find the key? By looking at it in context, right? That's how we find the key. That's how I was trained to study, and that's what we do. We look at the context to understand the passage to see what God intended to tell those who were reading. And so we do it that way. Now, as I read the passage, looking for the content, I noticed a pattern in the chapter. The chapter is divided into three parables. If you were to scan the whole chapter, you would see that. It's divided into three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, three parables, and then the lost son. So we're dealing with things that are lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And what does that tell us? Tell us? Well, if we, if we read the parables, we see that God is deeply concerned and in a desperate search for those that are lost. That's what the parable is about. God loves to look for those that are lost. He's deeply concerned and in desperate search for those that are lost. Has anybody ever been lost? It's a scary thing. I don't ever rem remember being lost, but I remember thinking we had lost one of our sons one time. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been a parent and thought you lost one of your kids? Scary, isn't it? Terrifying thing. I think I told you a story when Susan, I was building a house across the street and uh, Matthew was napping. He was just a toddler back then. And she said, I'm going to go visit one of my friends. Did I, did I get this story right or do I get it wrong? Not? She doesn't like when I tell this story. Um, anyways, the way I remember it, I came back to the house to check on Matthew and he was gone. I had the whole neighborhood looking for him. Come to find out, she came home. This is the part that I get wrong or it doesn't matter. Come to find out, she came home, got him, and went back to wherever she was and, here, and forgot to tell me. And I was, we had a whole, the whole neighborhood looking for Matthew. And uh, it was a scary time for me. She had him all along. That'll probably be the last time I ever tell that story. <laughs> so, yeah, we've had, we've had 
children get lost, and it's a scary thing. It can be a terrifying thing. It really, ha- really can be. And so the Lord is deeply concerned in a desperate search for those that are lost. Now, we have to remember that the parables that Jesus spoke are emblematic. That means that they have a lot of symbolism in them. They contain symbolism. And so the passage in it isn't about lost things. It's not about lost sheep. It's not about lost coins. It's not. Those things are not important, are they? But about lost souls, lost people, that's what's important to the Lord. Not coins, not sheep. I know you animal lovers aren't liking that, but he's not really talking about lost sheep. He's talking about lost people. And this is clarified in the last parable about the lost son. Uh, He narrows it down, and we understand now he's not talking about sheep. He's not talking about coins. He's talking about people. That's why the Malins have gone to China. Not because of the beautiful uh, topography, not because of the money they make for doing it. They've gone, not to teach math, so to speak, they've gone in search of lost souls. That's what's most important. And we can do that right here in our own backyard, can't we? Right here in Imperial, town of Imperial. So it's clarified by the parable of the lost son. In fact, the first two parables actually set up the passage for the last one. If you look at it, notice that. It kind of sets it up. Now, the first thing we learn and thus know about God is he is deeply concerned. I've already mentioned that in a desperate search for those that are lost. And that's comforting, wouldn't you say? I think it's very comforting when I, when I think about God in that context. Think about God, uh, when he, that he is so concerned and in a deep search for those that are lost. And it's, it's just comforting to me to know that about God. So that means that when you are out there doing the same work in a desperate search to find those that are lost, you're doing the will of God and you're doing the work of God. God is in total uh, and complete confidence in that which you're doing for him and that is trying to seek that which is lost. However, we still don't know who the dad is or the sons, the two sons are in the parable. And so I'm, I'm looking for the correct interpretation. I'm studying the passage. I'm reading commentaries. I'm looking at the language. And I have to look at more than just verses 11 through 32. I have to look beyond the verses, and I have to look forward before the verses. And looking before, I found the context, and it's very simple. If you'll notice verse 1 and 3 with me, it gives me the context and thus reveals who the three key players are. Notice what it says in verses 1 through 3. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew drew near to him, to hear him, that's Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes complaining, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. Spoke this parable to them. So as you can see, Jesus speaks these next three parables as a response to the Pharisees and the scribes' complaint. You got that? He does this as a response to the scribes and Pharisees' complaint. And this tells us that Jesus is speaking to whom? Who is he speaking to? That's right, he's speaking to the religious leaders. Somebody said that. Why? Because they're confused about the nature of God. They're very confused about the nature of God. Most man-made religions, all man-made religions, let me say that, all man-made religions are confused about the nature of God. And they are confused because they are man-made religions. They're not, it's not gospel. It's not scripture. So Jesus is going to enlighten them. He's going to open their eyes. He wants them to see the truth about their heavenly father. Regardless of what their religion had been teaching them, they were confused. And so he's going to open their eyes. He's going to enlighten them concerning the truth about God. They have had a wrong perception about God. They drawn from their own understanding. Remember, we're told that in Proverbs, do not lean upon your own understanding, but in all your ways, what? Acknowledge Him. You don't want to lean on your own understandings and from their own religious beliefs and not from the Scripture, not from the context of the Word of God. And it made them angry. It made them frustrated. It made them hateful and judgmental because of their wrong understanding of God. Now, they felt that way towards people in general and Particularly, they felt that way towards Jesus. We see that in these verses. They were frustrated, they were angry, they were hateful, and very judgmental towards Jesus because they had a wrong view of God, a wrong view of the Scriptures. 
Now, let's look a bit closer. Like the parable of the lost son, we see three people involved in verses 1 through 3. Who are they? Who are they? Jesus, the tax collector and sinner, or sinners, tax collectors and sinners, and scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees. This is the context of the passage, and now we know who is who. God is the Father, the tax collectors and sinners are the first son, are the first son, the ones that are lost, or got lost, all right? And who has stayed away from the Father and his home. And the scribes and Pharisees are the second son, the ones that are judgmental and self-righteous and envious and unforgiving. And that makes up the passage as a whole. That's one of the most awesome and telling passages found in the Gospels. It's one of the reasons why I love it so much because I'm the younger son, even if my birthday's today and I'm a year older. <laughs> I'm still one of the younger sons. Did you know that there's a controversy going on between when does the senior citizen age start? Is it 65 or 55? I guess it depends on the restaurant that you're in, right? I'm going to wait until it's 65. I thought 55 was middle age, and I'm okay with that, but I don't want to be called a senior. Not yet. And I'll just forego the uh, discount I get as a senior at Denny's and Carol's or wherever it is that you can get it at 55. I'll pay the regular rate, just so I don't have to be called a senior. Okay, let's get back to the passage. It's really not about the sons, although they are key players. Their role in the parable works as a way to shine light on the character of the Father. This is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is trying to open their eyes towards the truth about the Father, our Heavenly Father. They were confused about that. Not so much the Son, although they are involved, and they take great part in the parable, and they speak a lot about their character. The reality is that Jesus is revealing the character and nature of God the Father to his people and to us today. That's the great thing about the passage and that's what I love about it. We get to see the truth about our Heavenly Father and get, and get, get to know Him better and, to, and also uh, kind of erase or correct some of those wrong views that people have in their head about God, about the God of the Bible. Isn't that awesome? And so, um, it's really not about the Son, although they're key players their role in the parable works as a way to shine the light on the Father. You see, the Pharisees couldn't understand why Jesus, if he was truly from God, they couldn't understand why he would associate with such sinful people. They just didn't get that. They didn't understand it. They were too right, too self-righteous, not righteous, not in the eyes of God. They were just as sinful and just as fallen and just in need of a Savior as the tax collector, the sinner. They were all sinners. But some can't see that. Some couldn't see that. And those who can't see it are always judgmental against those who know they are sinners. Usually the very righteous are the ones, are, are the very religious, are the ones that think they are very righteous, and they look down at their nose at those who are less than they are religiously. And that's what's happening here. So they, the Pharisees couldn't see or understand why Jesus, if he was truly from God, would associate with such sinful people. Now, I wanted to stop for just a minute and say that the motivation that comes from those who seek the lost needs to come from this kind of attitude, that I am a sinner just like they, but I know what it is to understand the Father through redemption. And that's why I go out and I evangelize the lost. Because I've experienced to, you know, the, the, the redemption of the Father. I've been drawn by him, I've been accepted by him, I've been forgiven by him for my sin, I've been given a place in heaven from him or for, by him, and because of that, I have a desire like he to seek the lost. And so they couldn't understand why Jesus would associate with such people, but Jesus wanted them to know that, that God's son came to die for sinners. That's what he wanted them to know, that God's son the one they were in question about came to die for sinners, and that God is approachable no matter how sinful through His Son. That is, the, that is the passage here, that is the idea of the passage here, that God is approachable no matter how sinful through His Son. Listen, if God wasn't 
approachable through his son, no one would be saved, right? No one would be saved. But God is approachable. Yes, we learn a lot about the sinner and a lot about <clears throat> the self-righteous religious, who, by the way, are also sinners, as we can see. But most importantly, we learn about God the Father. That's what we're learning about here in this passage. We learn that no matter how sinful we are, if we come to God in humility, like the first son, if we come to God in humility, asking for forgiveness, he'll forgive us and grant us a home in heaven. And this is what I wanted to focus on this morning before we go, this exact point here in the passage. Now we learn from the parable that we must come to God the Father in humility and in honesty, remorseful over our sin. That's what we learn from the passage. We must come to God, I'll say it one more time, in humility, in honesty, remorseful over sin. So this is what God wants to see. He wants to see a brokenness over our sin. We must come in remorse over our sin. Um, sometimes we don't, we're not that way about our sin. We just kind of, uh, kind of in a blasé way pass it off. Oh, God's a forgiving God. God loves me. He forgives me. And, so, and, that, and that seems to be the attitude that we carry with us on a daily basis. But we need to understand that God is broken over sin. God is furious over sin. God is not happy with sin. God made a plan to deal with sin. And it was a very violent, very abusive plan. That's what the cross is about, right? That is not a... Although that's a very pretty cross, and handmade and fashioned and put together, what it symbolizes is not pretty at all. Uh, not at all. Crucifixion was not a pretty thing in the first century. It was a very ugly, ugly thing. Sometimes men were on, people were on the cross for days and days and days before they finally just rotted, off, rotted away on the cross. So it wasn't a pretty thing. And so we need to come to, to, the, come to the Father in humility and in honesty. Now how easy is it to be honest with ourselves? Can anyone tell me that? How easy is it how easy is it for us to be honest with ourselves, to take a good look at ourselves and say, this is who I am. This is who I am apart from Christ, apart from God's forgiveness. This is what I am. I was thinking about one of the songs when we were singing. I hope you do that. I hope when you're here on Sunday mornings and, and you know, we go through great length. I know that Amanda doesn't just look at a list and go one, two, three, four, we'll sing those. I believe she prays over those and is led by the Spirit. And there are times when I'll text her and say, hey, can we do these? Because they've been on my heart all week. And I, I'd like those to be expressed on Sunday morning. I was thinking about one of the songs, and I was thinking about how it was, it was describing God's greatness and His holiness and how vastly opposite I am of that. And I think of God in that light. I, I think if I am this sinful... And I am, believe me, <laughs> I need a Savior terribly bad. If I am this sinful, this fallen, this broken, how much greater, sinless, and holy God must be in comparison. And how ugly it must really be in His eyes. How ugly I must really be apart from the blood of Christ. And so we must be able to come humbly, and that's how we come humbly, a, a full and complete and total recognition of what we are, or who we are apart from Christ. And honestly, remorsefully, come to Him over, over our sin or because of our sin. And when we do, He'll forgive us and save us from our sin and the consequences of sin. He just doesn't just forgive our sins. He saves us from the consequences of our sin. What is, what is the consequence of sin according to Romans it's death. It's death. That's what it is. Physical and eternal death. He saves us from that. Even the physical death, He does. Our bodies will not go on the ground and corrupt and stay there. He's going to resurrect our bodies. And we'll spend an eternity with Him in our bodies, in a resurrected body. So he, is, he will undo that curse someday as well. And so He has saved us, forgiven us from the consequences of sin. And He'll open His arms wide 
and he'll accept us. No matter what we've done, that's the point of the passage. No matter what we have done, there's no depth of depravity that God can't save us from. There's no depth of sin that God can't forgive us of. He will. If we'll come to him in humility and honestly, remorseful over our sins. And no matter what class of people we are, that's another point that we got from the passage, no matter what class of people we are, rich or poor, famous or not, no matter what class, we learn later in the passage of Scripture that Jesus went into this land of Samaria, into the land of the Gentiles, and preached to them and healed them and ministered to them, showing the people of Israel that God hadn't come just for the Jews. He'd come for everyone. He'd come to him in humility and in honesty and remorseful over their sin. So this morning, although there's much here, I want to focus on the one we need to know most. The one we need to know most. And this is the father of the story. So notice then with me a father's love. The first son in, in selfishness asked for his inheritance early. He wanted it early. He didn't want to wait for his father's passing. He wanted it now. He's a very selfish young man. He's the younger of the two. He's the baby of the family. He's used to getting his way because he is the baby. <clears throat> so he's asking for his inheritance up front. And there's a lot of implications as to why that is so um, self-seeking or self-centered, self -centered, but it is. And he asked for his inheritance early. And he set out to live a life away from his home and his father's love, verse 12. And while away, we see the conditions, the first son's condition. If you'll notice it, verse 13 says he, was, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He wasted his possessions with prodigal living. You know what it is to waste something, don't you? The town of Imperial is going through great measures to make sure that we don't waste even an ounce of water. I've already gotten two tickets for a little bit of water on the curb. I'm, I'm finally just saying, forget it. I'll just put a desert scene out there and not worry about it, right? They don't want us to waste not even a little bit. This young man got his inheritance. And the, with all indications, it was huge. It was a lot. He was gone for a long time. He lived on it for a long time. Despite his waste, he still lived on it for a long time and lived, how? Sumptuously. He lived um, in a rich way. He lived it up, as they say. He got a huge inheritance up front and early. It was big. Verse 13 says, though, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And I think if we lead, lead, uh, read in between the lines there, it's more than just the physical possessions that he wasted. He wasted all the years of his father's love and teaching in his relationship to God on worthless living. Worthless living. That's what he wasted. And prodigal means what? It means wasteful. That's what it means. There's, I'm sure, several different half a dozen translations represented here this morning, even in this small group of people. King James says riotous. You know what a riot, what a riot's like, don't you? It's crazy. If you've been in one or been around one, our NASB says loose, loose living. ESV says reckless. The good speed. None of you probably have a good speed. I have one in my office. They're very old and they're actually quite a collection to have. Um, one of the most accurate English translations. But just not ready or available. They're not in print any longer, but you can get them. He says, fast living, and then the NIV says, wild living. And these are terms that we as parents desire to be associated with our children, right? These are the kind of terms that we hope our children grow up to be, right? Just loose, reckless, fast, wild. We hope when they leave the nest, they will become wasteful and, and uh, riotous and loose and reckless. And that's what we hope for. We pray for that prodigal. As the Greek has it, living in debauchery. That's the little Greek. Living in debauchery. He went out and lived in debauchery. Right? This is not what every parent hopes for in their child. Well, as God would have it, this type of reckless abandonment 
always leads to ruin, doesn't it? It may be fun at the beginning, and it, I'm sure it was when he was living it up and had all that money, had all those false friends. They weren't really his friends. We find out that, you know, friends can be bought, but you can't keep them when the money's gone. You always have friends when you've got money in your pocket. And as I, said, as I said, as God would have it, this type of reckless abandonment always leads to ruin. It always does. It is what we call a self-destructive attitude in life. And it will lead to ruin. And the depth of ruin depends on God's plan for the individual. But this kind of lifestyle will take you all the way to the bottom if you can linger that long, all the way to the bottom, which is a terrible place to be. But notice the passage, 14 through 17. But when he had spent it all, spent it all, there arose a severe famine in that land. Interesting how God's sovereign hand is always working, right? God's providential hand is always working. God so had it, kind of like we saw in Jonathan's message last week about Jonah and how God moved the, the fish and move the circumstances and uh, move the sailors and move the storm. Here God waits until he spends everything. And then there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be what? In need. In need. It's interesting. I didn't come to faith in the Lord in this way. I, I didn't. I didn't really have a need. I had no physical need when I came to the Lord. I was in the military. They provided everything. Well, almost everything. Most things. The basic needs. I didn't really come to the Lord because I, had, I was in want of my basic needs. Didn't, that wasn't my need when I came to the Lord. I wasn't looking to God to fill my mouth or to fill my pocketbook to give me a place to live. I had all that in the military. But I came the same way this young man comes once he becomes in want. Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. He found someone there and he sent him into his field to feed swine. This is not a pretty thing for Jews, the Jewish people. The swine was an unclean animal. They couldn't, they couldn't eat it. They couldn't get around it. it. It was one of those kind that played in the mud and lived in the mud and, and ate the mud and regurgitated the mud and, and just kind of wallowed in the mud. It was a dirty animal. Saying, I'm never going to eat pork again. You can. You're not Jewish unless you are. This was not a good situation for a good little Jewish boy. Well, it wasn't a good little Jewish boy, but for a little Jewish boy, a Jewish man... It wasn't a good situation to be feeding swine. But God wasn't done with him. He was still going down. Still going down. He said he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. Have you ever had to do that? Have you ever watched somebody eat out of a trash can? Have you ever watched that? Have you ever had to eat out of a trash can? Do you know what it's like? Have you ever sat at a restaurant and saw one of those people from the street come in and start eating off the food that's left over? It kind of turns your stomach, doesn't it? You think, how can he do that? How can that person do that? That's what's happening here. It's worse because he's eating what? What's he eating? You farm people. What's he eating? Pig slop. It's all that stuff that comes off the restaurant that goes in the buckets. The leftovers from the tables that are busted and taken out to the back and thrown in buckets and sit for maybe a day or two and then slop the pigs with it. And the pigs love it. This is what he's eating. His riotous lifestyle has taken him all the way down to the bottom. He's eating garbage. That's what he's eating. And he would love to have some of that. None of, I don't think any of us know what it is to starve to that point. We don't know what it is to find that kind of meal tasty and worth eating. This is a picture of, of what sin is. Didn't you notice that? You know that? That's what this is. It's a picture of sin in God's eyes. 
an ugly thing. We don't really look at ourselves that way. But we could all say, yeah, I'm a prodigal because that's the point. We either find ourselves the younger son or we find ourselves the older son, but we're one of the two, nothing in between. We're one of the two. So he'd gladly fill his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. The world is cruel, isn't it? How many of you have known the world to be cruel? It's a cruel place. Man. I know it had to be cruel. You know, we, we live very sheltered lives here in the valley. We do. Some of us have had very nice homes, with very responsible, loving parents. We don't know what it's like to live out into the world where the world is cruel and no one will give you anything. But when he came to himself, it's a good place to come to. When he came to himself, in other words, when he realized where he was, you know, I don't know how long it took him, a day, a week, a month, a year. I don't know, sometimes it takes a long time to realize where you are, right? I don't know how long he was eating pig slop. I don't know. But he came to himself. And that was God's intention all along, right? That was God's intention all along, that he would eventually come to himself. It's amazing what the mind can do, how deceptive it can be. How maybe at one point he thought pig slop was pretty good. But one time went on, he, one, day, one day he must have just woke up and said, What am I doing? I'm eating pig slop! And I like it! But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired... He's getting really smart now. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And to spare. How much blessing I could have back at my father's house. Even his servants have an abundance. He's beginning to remember what it was like to be the youngest son and I, he says, I am perishing, I'm dying with hunger. Notice again the words, verse 17, when he came to himself. This is where everybody has to come in life. If we're going to be able to approach the Father, this is a point. You have to come to this place. This is, this is a picture of salvation. This is a picture of the Jewish nation. They had this huge religious si system, and they thought they were... You know, right before God because of the system. And Jesus was saying, no, you are not. Your religion has failed you and has lied to you. You cannot come to God this way. You cannot make your own prescription. You must come this way. When he was talking about the prodigal, he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, the most religious leaders of his day, and saying, that is the way. That is the way. The humility... In honesty, through repentance. So if we're going to be able to approach the Father, we must come to ourselves, or come to the end of ourselves. And this is where the first son realized his need for his father. This is where he realized that he, was, he had been wasteful. And it's where we see our need for a Savior. You know, and I, you know the, it just crossed my mind. It's not even in my notes. I think the American dream has, has blinded us for our need our American way of living has blinded us for our need for God. Because we, we live so well. Maybe that's going to change soon. But it has. And part of that is all part of God's will. I know, I understand that. We live so sumptuously. In our homes, and I, I, I have a nice home. It's not mine, but my wife has made it really nice. She's decorated it really well. She uses a lot of wisdom, and she's good with our money, and she handles what we get very well, and, and we work real hard to make sure that we have nice things, and it makes us comfortable in the house that we're in. We're not exempt from those niceties in life. Sometimes we use that to cover up. Sometimes it's a facade, isn't it, to who we really are. So he realizes that he's been wasteful. 
And it's where we see our need for a Savior. And just as cru- crucial, it's, it's where the Son sees himself and he sees that he's really a sinner. He's really a sinner. That's what he sees. I hope we don't have to get down in the mud and eat pig slop before we can see this. But that's what the Lord is saying here. You see, when the first son had everything, he couldn't see his need. He was full of pride and self-indulgence. We can never see our sin that way. But now it's all gone, and he's left to himself. And as he looked at himself, he saw his own sin, and he realized his need. And he said, I want to go home. I want to go home to my father. Verse 18. Well, that's his condition. Notice his confession, because it's got to be there. A gospel without a confession, a gospel without the reality of a person's sin, this whole, this whole um, quasi-pseudo-gospel that's come around in the last 30 years, you're wonderful, you're worth all of this stuff. That's not a gospel presentation. This is the gospel. This is by the word of the Lord himself. The condition of man before salvation is not something that's made you worth something. You're worth nothing. That's what makes salvation so great. What makes God so glorious. He sent his son for one who eats in the mud with the pigs. Notice his confession, verse 18, 19, and 20. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned. There it is. The controversial term in today's culture, sin. The one that everybody stays away from. Even the greats like Joel Osteen with his 60,000 member congregation. He doesn't use the term. And if he does, he uses it very loosely. Because his congregation wouldn't be so big if he used it in a biblical way. I have sinned against heaven before you. No longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I'll do that. This is humility, isn't it? This is brokenness. Make me like one of your hired. He didn't say hire me, just, just give me some of their food. Give me some of their shelter. I'll take it. Anything. Just don't want to be out there with the pigs anymore. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. Psalms 34, 18 says that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And save such as has a contrite spirit. Also, in, I read in Psalms 51, 17 that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. I was reading the other day in Psalms, it talks about the, the offerings and sacrifices of righteousness. This is what the Lord wants. Broken and contrite heart. These you will not despise. And as we've been saying over the last couple of weeks, as John has so eloquently put it out, this is the only way we can approach a holy, righteous, sinless, and all-knowing God. The only sacrifice he accepts is the sacrifice of a broken heart, that's broken over its own sin. And coming to him in humility and honesty saying, yes, I have sinned. I have. These are the sacrifices, the psalmist says, that God will not despise. You know, in the context, the blessings of heaven are withheld until we come to this place. Let's go to our next point, the Father's love. And we'll end with this. The Father's love. How does the Father respond to such a confession? when his son is in such a condition? How does the father respond to such a confession when his son is in such a condition? This is a, this is a very key point. It's very important that we understand this. How does the father's love respond to the son when he's in such a condition? 
some of you are parents, some of you have been parents, some of you are going to be parents. You need to understand how this happens. I tried my very best as a father, and I still do today. And I'm still a father, even though one's 28, almost 29, and one's 21, almost 22. When they come to me like this, I try to never shame them and make them feel terrible about what they've done. Because they already do. They already do. My responsibility is if they've repented and they're sorrowful over their sin, is to do what? To forgive them. To forgive them. Never bring it up again. Cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, as the scripture says. As far as the east is from the west, put it in the small of your back. Does he kick him when he's down? Does he thrust upon him damning and shameful words? Does he hold it against him? Does he require some work, some recompense, some making of right, the wrong? Does he rehearse all the wrong and harm the son has caused? Does he withhold forgiveness? We do that. We do that. Keep reminding them of their sin. Keep shaming them. You know, hold them in a little cage and let them know the cause and the damage they created. The father doesn't do that, does he? Notice a loving father's response, verse 20b. But when he still, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and what? Had compassion. He ran and fell at his neck and kissed him. I don't know, someone said this a long time ago. The father must have been looking down the road waiting every day. Waiting for his son to return, to be able to see him a far way off. Waiting to have compassion on him. He ran and fell at his neck and he kissed him. And how does a loving father respond to a confession? A repenting, broken-hearted son. With compassion, not condemnation. That's what Paul said to the Romans in 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. No, how much condemnation? None. None. It's as if you had never done it. To those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How then does the loving father respond to his remorseful son? With no condemnation, but with what? What's the passage say? Compassion. Compassion. And the Father's compassion is displayed in the remainder of the passage there. Let me give it to you quickly. First, the loving Father waits and wants for his Son to return, verse 20. But when he was still a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion and fell and ran and kissed his neck. As we can see every day, the Father looked down the road, as I said a moment ago, waiting and wanting for his son's return. One day when he saw him afar off, he couldn't wait any longer. He runs to him. He runs to him. Second, a loving father waves the transgression of his son's sins. Verse 21 and 22. You know, the father never ever mentioned the squandering of the, the, the inheritance that he had given him. I think the second brother was upset about it because, you know, how much would have been given at the end was much less than would have been given at the beginning because you used some of it up. So it cut into the brother's share. He didn't like that. The loving father waves the transgressions of his sons there. I've sinned against heaven. Look at this. He knows it is God who he has sinned against first. And your sight. I'm no longer worthy. He called your son. But, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, and put it on him. The best robe, the best robe, the most expensive. Holds no, he holds back no expense. He's given him all this money to go and squander. He comes back and he gets out the best robe. Kind of like Jacob. Remember Jacob got the best robe? He got the best robe and a ring. That's a sign of ownership. Your mind. 
belong to me. Sign of ownership. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And a ring on his hand. And what? Sandals. That's one of the basic needs. He obviously had sold them or somebody had stolen them. Or he just wore them out. Shoes are real important, aren't they? We don't think so. We have so many of them. I happen to like shoes. I got this thing about shoes. You know? And, uh... I don't, I don't think we realize, because we have so many, how important they are. It, it's a symbol here of the father's provision and protection over his son. A good pair of shoes is a good thing to have. And if you were without them, you would understand that. If you had to walk out here, I saw some, saw some woman the other day. I was parked on Main Street and uh, Imperial Avenue. I was heading south. And there was a woman trying to walk on the sidewalk a couple, what was it, a week before last week when that was 115? She was trying to walk on the sidewalk about 1 o'clock. She was jumping from shade to shade to shade. Shoes are very important. So he's got it all. He's got the robe, the best robe, the ring, a pair of sandals. And before, the, before the son had a chance to finish what he planned to say, the loving father waved the transgression There was no need to go after the sins of the past. The father had already forgotten. And over the joy of his son's return, the third point is a loving father welcomes his son. Welcomes him. There's no greater evidence of forgiveness than the welcome of the one you have sinned against. They throw open their arms, sit you down and make you feel at home. They even go overboard. I think that works against the person, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It really, if you're, especially if you're feeling really unworthy, if you're feeling really unworthy, and they just kind of roll out the red carpet. And that's the last point this morning. Fourth, a loving father whoops it up for his son. Bring out the fatted calf, kill it, let's eat, let's be merry, for this my son was dead. He's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. And they began, it says in verse 24, they began to make merry. You see, there's reason to celebrate when a lost sinner comes home. We see this expressed three times in the chapter. Now, the celebration was a rejoicing over the lost sheep over the lost coin and over the lost son when he was found. You know, the father takes a great deal of risk here, doesn't he? By making such a great deal out of it, he's taking a great risk. Is there any guarantee the son won't take off again? We don't live on what ifs. We don't. The Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices over the one that that was lost but has come home. Conclusion. So Jesus wants the religious, self-centered, and judgmental Pharisees and scribes to know the truth about God. They are uh, demonstrated in the older son. We don't have time to go over that today. But he wants the religious, self-centered, and judgmental Pharisees and scribes to know the truth about God. That is... He'll never turn away anyone who comes to him in repentance, humility, and honesty. He will never do that. Never. Realizing his own sin and need for a Savior. In context, the religious Pharisees were the ones that were in wrong. They were blinded by pride and self-righteousness, believing they were right with God because they were so religious. But it's repenting, sorrowful sinners that receive the blessing of God and get to come home to the Father's house and inherit eternal life. And the Lord was demonstrating that, the love of the Heavenly Father. And what better way to observe Father's Day than taking our example from our Heavenly Father, amen? You see, these were the things that brought me to the Father. As I said, I, I had all my basic necessities in life. I even had more than that. 
My, par- my parents provided a very good living for us kids. We always had all the food we could ever want. My mom always made sure she always went without so that we could have. And always, we always had the name brand clothes. In the 70s, you know, it was all name brand, Hang 10, um, OP, all the name brand clothes, you know. We had all that. My mom always wanted to know what was in, what was cool, what was fashionable. Let's go get it. Today it's cell phones, right? (laughs) Yeah. And actually the military took pretty good care of us. At least the army did. We were never hungry. We always had shoes on our feet, boots on our feet, and clothes on our back, and a warm bed most of the time. Sometimes we were in a very wet, cold environment, but most of the time they treated us very well. I didn't come to Christ for physical needs. I had a great, huge spiritual need. I did. I was a huge sinner. I knew that by the time I was 18. I understood that clearly. I couldn't find it in any other place. I couldn't find it in religion. I couldn't find it in relationships. I needed Christ. I needed to be forgiven by the Father. And he had been waiting and watching down the road for 18 years until I finally turned to him in humility and brokenness and asked for forgiveness. And he gave it. And he's never, ever com- condemned me for my sin. Never. I have looked back at my sin. Satan has caused me to look back at my sin. But he has never stuck it in my face. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture that so clearly and concisely tells the truth about salvation and what it really is. It has been fabricated and refabricated and changed and and modified to fit the thoughts of man, to fit his whims. He's been given terms to make it more palatable, more easier to understand, more easier to accept. The reality is it's hard to believe unless you're in the heart of it, unless we go your way, the narrow way. We thank you, Lord, that it can be presented clearly and concisely if we'll just stick to the context of the passage and know what salvation truly is. We trust, Lord, today that your Spirit has been working in all our hearts as we try to find out where we are in this parable. We all have been the prodigal, whether we want to admit it or not whether we realize it or see it or not, we've all been the prodigal. Lost. Wallowing in mire. Eating garbage. But we can also be the second son in the fold. and not able to see, just like the first son, religious, maybe to a fault, but not able to see that we're poor and miserable and broken because we've covered it up with all our trappings. makes us feel comfortable on the outside. Help us, Lord. Have mercy on us. Show us our sin, that we might repent of it and come to you for a clean slate. Perhaps there's someone here today who needs a reckoning, who needs to be made right before God. You see it. We all do, but maybe you see it. God is speaking to you even now. He's mercifully and graciously drawing you to Him. Take advantage of it. in humility and honestly 
and honesty. Confess, repent, and come clean. Regardless of what side of the story you're on. Do that today. And your inside will match your outside. Which is most important. Father, if there's someone here today that needs to know you desperately, may you press it upon their heart. May they cry out in their heart and with their mind for salvation. May they ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, if there's someone here today who's blinded because they think themselves so right and yet treat others with contempt, pray you show them how bad that really is and how and what an offense it is to you Lord there's a, a depth of, of uh, Christianity a depth of relation they, could, they are not having with you that they could have with you if they would just realize what they're doing pray this in Christ's name Amen